In this video, we're going to take a look at optimization tips for substance materials. Here in our Substance Designer 5 documentation, we have a detailed section on performance optimizations. This in-depth guide will detail everything you need to know about optimizations. Now, let's take a look at some of these key optimizations and workflows. So let's start with resolution. You need to be careful about the resolution of the graph and the relative to parent settings. High values will seriously affect performance. So consider how the material is likely to be used and whether you can reduce the data sizes involved. You can oftentimes use a lower resolution and tile the material. So here in this example, you can see that I have my base parameters and I have my resolution output size set to relative to parent. This means that the substance is going to have the ability to dynamically resize and it's going to take on the resolution of the host application. So for example, here in Substance Designer, that default resolution is set to 256. When we take this into Unity, that default resolution will be 512. And we can change this resolution. So here in Unity, I'm within the block end scene that's part of the demo project. And I have this large ground plane that's actually divided into multiple planes. And if I take a look at one of these planes, I can see that the plane itself measures out to be 10 units. Now, if I take a look at this distance tool, here you can see that I have a desired resolution set to 2048 or 2K. And at 10 units, this is going to equal around 205 pixels per unit. So I'm wanting each one of these individual planes to occupy a 2K texture. Now, if I come over here to my substance and we take a look at the material, you can see that I have my tiling set to two by two. This means that with the substance, I can actually use a target width and height resolution of 1K. By tiling this 1K texture, I'm able to get the desired 2K resolution. This means that I'm using a much more optimized version of this substance instead of having its resolution set to absolute 2K. You will want to minimize node output size whenever possible. So here in this example, I have a noise and a uniform color that's being blended using this blend node and this opacity slider. So if I look at the base output size here for this graph, you can see that right now it's set to absolute 2K. And this means that each of these nodes are going to be rendering out at 2K resolution because I have their output size set to relative to parent. Well, if we take a look at this color node, you can see that this is just a uniform value. And so having this node be set by the host application, which in our case is going to be 2K, is way higher than we actually need. And this is not a very optimized setup. So what I'm going to do is select this node and I'm going to set its output size to absolute. Now I'm actually going to change the output size to a very small value, which is going to be 16 pixels by 16 pixels. Now, 16 by 16 is the lowest size that we can set, as anything lower than this is going to slow down rendering performance. So now, let's take a look at what we have. Here I'm going to just double click my blend node, and you can see that it's being set to this 16 by 16, and that's because this uniform color is being fed into this background input. So in order to fix this, I'm gonna select this node, and instead of having its default output size being set to parent, I'm gonna switch this to relative to parent. So now you can see that the uniform color is set to an absolute 16 by 16 pixel. However, my noise and my blend node is still going to have its resolution set based on the parent's resolution. So here I'll double click to get to the root of the graph and it's set to, again, absolute 2K. So let's just adjust this parameter. So here, let's just bump this down to 1K. So I'll just set this to, your, to 1K for the width and height. And now notice that we have our uniform value still at 16 by 16, and our nodes, again, are just resizing based on the parent. And so by utilizing a setup such as this, we create a more optimized network here for our nodes and resolution. Here we have another example of controlling node size. So to create this rock pattern, I'm utilizing some noises. And so notice here, instead of using these noises uh, being relative to parent, so again, remember, they're going to uh, have the ability to resize based on the host application resolution setting. Instead of using that, I'm going to force 
this noise here to be a 64 by 64 pixel image. So I'm reducing its size for optimization purposes. Same thing here with this noise. So I'm making sure that I reduce this to 64 by 64. And here, this noise here, this cloud, 64 by 64. Now these noises, again, are just being used uh, throughout the process of creating this rock shape. Now, once I make this change, notice again here on this blend node, I have the output size set to be relative to parent. By default, it's set relative to input, which means that it's going to inherit this 64 by 64 pixel because this data is coming here into my background node. So we just need to make sure that we set this to be relative to parent. This again allows us to optimize the size of the noise, yet retain the size here relative to parent for our host that we're going to need for the actual texture. When it comes to bit depth, you should always use 8-bit when 16-bit is not needed. For example, the Substance CPU engine does not actually support 16-bit color or 8-bit grayscale. The GPU engine supports all four combinations of 8 and 16 bits and grayscale and color. At this time, only the CPU engine is used inside of Unity. So here I have an example where I have a normal map and I'm using the normal to height ambient occlusion and curvature nodes to derive some data that I'm using within this metal edgeware filter. Now when I use these nodes internally they are set to work with 16-bit. So here you see that for my normal to height it's 16-bit, my ambient occlusion is 16-bit, and my curvature is 16-bit. Now when I feed these maps here into the metal edgeware generator you can see that this is working at 16-bit as well and if I check the output it is 16-bit. So to optimize this, I can actually switch this node to work in 8-bit. So with this node selected, I can come over here to this output format, and I can just drop this down to absolute and make sure that 8 bits per channel is selected. Now notice that when I double-click the node, you can see that we're actually working with 8 bits per channel. Here in the output of the Metal Edgeware, we're also at 8 bits. Another tip for changing nodes such as this curvature node that is internally working within 16-bit is that I can insert a levels node here and use that to change the output format. So here, for example, I have the node selected. Let's just hit the space bar and let's just grab a levels node. And so here it's connected in the chain with the levels node selected. Notice now that it's outputting 16 bits per channel. Let's come over here to our output format and let's set this to absolute and here we're now working in 8 bits per channel. Notice that we've basically demoted the bit depth from that curvature using this levels node. So you can use the output format on a node or an output format controlling node placed after the node that you want to demote to change bit depth. Also be aware that everything can be relative to the parent. So here I'll double click in an empty spot on my graph to get to the root level of this graph. For the output format, if I want to, I could set this to absolute 8 bits per channel. So now when we come over here to this levels node and instead of using the output format absolute, we could switch this here to be relative to parent. The outcome is the same and we're still working with 8 bits per channel. So notice here we go back to our curvature, it's locked at 16 bit, however we're using this levels node to demote that down to 8 bit, so we will be working with 8 bits per channel downstream of nodes in our graph. You should try to reuse nodes as much as you can. So going back to this example that we showed with bit depth, here I have my normal map. And as I mentioned, I was able to derive additional data such as ambient occlusion and curvature from this single normal map input. This allows me to use one single embedded texture in the substance instead of having to bake the normal, the AO, and the curvature, which would then bring my embedded bitmap count up to three and thus increasing the overall size of the published SBSAR file. However, this can have an adverse effect on generation time. Since I'm adding a curvature, normal to height, and AO node, I'm asking the Substance Engine to generate this data. This in turn adds to the generation time of the substance. Whereas if I added just the actual embedded bitmaps for height, curvature, and AO, the graph computation time would be lower at the expense of a larger SBSAR file size. So it becomes a trade-off of generation time versus file size. Depending on your project needs, you can decide which option is better suited. In regards to embedded bitmap, you're going to want to make sure that you set the bitmap format to JPEG. Now, the exception to this would be with normal maps. Notice here I've kept the bitmap format set to raw. 
because the compression on the normal map could cause artifacts. So for these other embedded bitmaps, notice again here I've set this bitmap format to JPEG, and this will drastically reduce the size of the published SBSAR file when you're embedding bitmaps within the substance package itself. Also, keep in mind the resolution that you have set for the bitmap. So for instance, if we take a look at this normal map that we have, and let's say that in my project, I know that I will never use a 2K resolution. My game dictates that the highest resolution I'll use is a 1K texture. Well, I should not publish this substance with an embedded 2K normal map if I'm never actually going to use that. So in this case, I would just drop this here down to 1024 by 1024 as the absolute output size for this normal map. This will also reduce the size of the published substance. So here I'd like to showcase how I organize my substance packages. So here you can see that I have a rock ground graph, and then here I have a folder called utilities with several graphs contained within it. Now, this very top graph that I call rock ground, this is going to be my main graph, which is going to become a material that I'm going to use within Unity. Now, I could have several materials that I want to have available to me in Unity, but in the case of this substance package, I only have this single material. Now, here within the utilities, I have several graphs that I use to build up components that I will use in my main materials. So for example, I start with some rock shapes. So each one of these rock shape graphs are designed to give me different rock shapes that I then use within this rock face graph. I also have a dirt ground material. Now, I don't want to utilize this material itself. It's actually going to get composited within this main graph. So that's why I have it here within my utilities. The idea is that if you try to place everything within one huge graph, not only are you using a ton of nodes, but it also becomes very difficult and complex to make changes or maintain this graph as you start to build a complex material. So if we take a look at my actual rock ground material that I'm going to be using inside of Unity, you can see that it's actually pretty simplistic. That's because I'm instancing several of these utility graphs, again, that are components that build up parts of this main rock ground material, and this allows me to keep a very clean and organized graph. So for instance here, if we just kind of zoom in, you can see that I have my dirt ground. If I need to make changes to my dirt ground, I can just go into this self-contained graph here and make changes. Now imagine if I had all of these nodes here as part of this dirt ground, and I had those placed here within the rock ground. You can see again how complex that gets and it becomes very tough to manage. So I always try to break off elements of my material into these utility type graphs. By breaking my graph up into components like this, I'm also creating a lot of reusable modular elements, which makes creating materials much faster. Now, when I actually publish this substance, I only want this rock ground to be available to me. I don't want to see all these other graphs. Again, because they're just components I'm utilizing in this main rock ground material. So what you can do is select the graph, and here under attributes, there's this output computation button. Now notice here for my main graph, my rock ground, it's set to yes. Now if I come over to one of my utility nodes, let's just take a look at this rock shapes 01, you can see that its output computation is set to no. Same thing here with rock face, output computation is set to no. This means I can instance these graphs and use them in my main graph, but when I publish the substance itself, only the graph or graphs that have their output computation set to yes are going to be available to me inside of Unity. So now let's jump over to Unity and take a look at this published substance. So here we are in Unity, and notice again, rock ground. This is the material where I had the output computation set to yes. It's the only material available to me. And this allows me to, again, easily maintain and manage a very complex material, as well as give me a very clean and simplified substance to work with here inside of Unity.